This video is for Core Practical 1, the Mechanics Core Practical for the first year of A-Level, and the purpose of it is to measure the acceleration due to gravity with a gravitational field strength, often known as G. We know, of course, that our gravitational field strength should be 9.81 newtons per kilogram, or 9.81 meters per second squared. So we're aiming to get a value somewhere around that. And there are two methods that Edexcel suggests you use for this. And we're going to go through each of those two methods because they use different equations of motion, which is why they've suggested it. And I will talk you through the equations, how you describe the practicals, what graphs you should be plotting, and then what advantages and disadvantages there might be to using technology to do this experiment. The first suggested method is that you use a magnet ball drop. Attach the ball here to the magnet at the top. Both the magnet and the plate are connected to a timer. And when you press the switch, the electromagnet turns off, the ball drops, and when it hits the plate at the bottom, it stops the timer. So you get the time it takes to fall this distance s. Because the ball is stationary when attached to the magnet, you can remove ut as part of this equation. Therefore, the equation becomes, and of course, because the a here is actually g, it then becomes, we do need to rearrange this equation because our independent variable is s, and therefore our independent variable needs to be in the x position of any equation, any equation of a line. So we're going to rearrange this to, and a little simplification gives us d squared is equal to 2 over g times s. This experiment should produce a straight line through the origin because that is in the format y is equal to mx. And because what is in the m position here is a constant, 2 divided by r acceleration due to gravity, that means the line will be straight. And we're going to put s on the x-axis and t squared on the y-axis and form our graph from there. So what you're changing is the s. So you take different values of the height that you've suspended the magnet with the ball attached above the plate. Uh, six values, six to eight, just to be sure. And then you're going to measure, or rather the electronics are going to measure the time it takes the ball to fall from that height. You get data that looks something like this. You don't have to worry about going up in different intervals of height with this because we're using electronics to measure it. It's not a big deal. We then take one, two, three, times, repeat the experiment three times and take an average, and of course because we're plotting our t-squared we have to calculate that. You'll note that the significant figures all the way through are kept, so from the average of t I've kept the same number of significant figures to t-squared, and that is what you should always do for calculated data. For our raw data, that is the height and the time, we keep the same number of decimal places because those are based on the resolution of the instrument. So here's our data. What sort of graph should we get? Well, when we plot s against t squared, like we said before, we are expecting to get a straight line through the origin. And the gradient of that line should be equal to 2 over g, because that was what was in our m position in our equation. And here is the actual line from that data. You can see that the gradient here is given to us as 0.2049, so we're going to make that equal to 2 over g, and solve that for g. I will speed the calculation up. You can pause and do the calculation yourself if you like. giving us a value of 9.761. Not bad when we compare it to 9.81. That's a percentage error of 0.5%. The second method suggested by Edexcel is slightly trickier to do, but it's based upon another equation of motion, which is why they've suggested it. A lot of the experiments that you will see are all based upon the s equals ut plus a half at squared. This one uses a different equation of motion, so it is useful to explore it. And with this one, you need to drop a cylinder of a known length d, and you need it to fall vertically so that it falls through a light gate at the bottom of its motion. And so you're measuring the distance from the light gate to where you dropped the cylinder. And that's your s. It's tricky because you have to, of course, make sure that the cylinder goes through the light gate vertically. And to do that, we use, usually, 
a dropping tube like this. It's got to be made of clear plastic or glass so that the light gate can be put around it and it will measure the speed of the cylinder as it passes through because that, that's what you're doing. So this is going to measure the time that the cylinder is passing through. You can hand calculate the velocity as the distance over time if you like or you can put the distance, the length of the cylinder, into the data logger and have the data logger directly collect the velocity for you. Now again, because we are dropping it from rest, your u squared becomes zero, and so we're left with v squared is equal to 2as. Now in this situation, it is already in the form of y equals mx, because again, we're going to change s, so we're going to make move the light gate farther up or further down the tube that you drop the cylinder through. And so s is our x variable. And then we're going to square our values for v that we get from the data logger. And that means that 2 times a or 2 times g in this situation will be our gradient. So when we use our data to plot a graph, we will have v squared in meters squared per second squared on the y-axis and s in meters on the x-axis and again we're expecting to get a straight line through the origin this time with our gradient equal to 2a. Both of these graphs produce straight lines because the equation can be rearranged into the format of y equals mx and what is in the m section of that equation is constant and therefore the line is straight. One of the questions Edexcel asks us to consider here is what are the advantages of data logging? And by data logging, I think they mean using electronic apparatus as opposed to manually operated apparatus. And the first thing is that the timing of this would be impossible because of reaction time errors. And as a result, it is more accurate. The second one is the resolution that you get. You get a very high resolution set of data using an electronic timer like this. You saw that I got four decimal places in for my times. This data is also very precise. Again, from my table, you can see that the repeat data clusters very closely together, and that is the definition of precision. So what we, that leads to is a very low uncertainty because we use half the range of the repeats to find our uncertainty. And if the repeats are clustered very low, very closely together, your half range becomes very small and therefore your uncertainty becomes very small. The other thing that edXL asks us to consider is what effect air resistance would have on your value of G. When we use the value 9.81 for G, we're assuming that the only force on the ball is its weight. And that accelerates all objects towards the Earth at 9.81 meters per second squared. However, if you have air resistance, that means you have a resistive force in the opposite direction, which means that your resultant force will be less, causing a lower value for the acceleration. So if air resistance is an issue, you would expect to see a lower value. We did get a lower value, so we might suggest that that's caused by air resistance.